All right, I'm going to lead you into some questions on profitability within your operation, what some of your drivers of success are. So you're a honey producer, and I'm going to, just going to talk real quick about what makes honey. Um, big hives make honey. There's been studies that show that if you double the population of bees within a hive, their honey production will go up by 250 to 300%. So it's very efficient to have extremely populated hives because you have less woodenware cost with more honey production coming out of those hives. So one of your goals has got to be to have very populated hives. And that is a challenge for you, especially because of your lack of diversity and the timing of the incoming resources in the hive. And in my area, we have, uh, according to the honeybee net forage map, we have 50 species of plants that are beneficial or important to honeybees. We have seven major nectar flows. I checked your area and you've got 17 that are listed and only three or four that are considered major nectar flows. And all of those three or four are, are planted. Um, so it's very different to, to have big hives by the time the canola blooms, you have got to supplement them a lot to stimulate that growth, to simulate the brood cycles. Um, another thing that makes hives and this is going to be sound very simple almost to the point of being dumb but dead bees don't make honey uh, dead bees don't make nukes dead bees don't make packages dead bees don't do anything so you've got to be looking at your death loss and i know you're wintering in a in a shed you're very very cognizant of that you're very methodical with trying to milk that death loss to get it down as low as it possibly can be. Um, a, another huge influencer of honey production is your swarm rate. Uh, when bees swarm, I have seen studies. I saw one study in the lives of bees by Dr. Seeley. He said that on average, 72% of the bees in the hive leave with the mother queen. Some people estimated at 50%, but if 50 to 70% of your bees leave, your honey production is going to be just dramatically reduced. Um, and I know that you're managing your swarm rate through the split. So um, you're taking that swarm energy and turning it into more hives. So I'd just like to talk about some of those things and, and see if there are, you know, what metrics do you really track? How do you track those and, and um, what do you consider successful? Boy, that's a loaded question. That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> big hives. Uh, let's start there. That's uh, our goal as beekeepers is to create the environment to grow these big hives to be able to bring in that big crop. Because you're ex ex absolutely right. It, when you have a hive that has you know fifty thousand workers in there uh, to be able to bring in the resource, it's going to bring in more than a hive that has twenty five thousand. Right? It's just a matter of math. That's all it is. So then the uh, your lead in kind of focuses on how do you get those big hives with limited amount of resources out there to build them out. Um, it and that um, I guess that kind of falls into the overall strategy of, and how I'm I manage my hives. Uh, would you say you have one like when you collect honey or you you're focusing on your honey crop? Are you looking at uh, one? time to collect that honey or multiple times throughout the year? It, it really depends. Um, we do have opportunity to collect varietals at some points, um, but typically I'm going to wait until the spring flow is over and probably pull honey in early to mid July because it, at that point, late July, early August, it's extremely important to get on mite treatments and I don't want to have honey boxes on hives while I'm doing mic treatments. Um, and then we go into a summer dearth where you don't do anything. And some years we can make a little bit of fall honey, but it's usually just enough to um, get the, get the hives in good condition for winter. When guys are talking to me about this, they're asking about 
exactly the question you, you're leading into here. Like, how do you um, manage your hives to extract the maximum amount of revenue from them throughout the spring? And I, I tell them, well, when is the period of time you see the most benefit to be able to gather that crop? Uh, for me, you look at what we have going on here, and we have that huge amount of crop that flowers midsummer. Just absolutely perfect timing. So absolutely everything throughout the entire year is focused on that three to four week period throughout the summer. I talked to some guys maybe in BC, their opportunity is a little bit sooner than that, more so in April, May, that is when they have their, their peak of honey production. So I say, you got to focus your management around that period of time to be able to set the deck to extract as much of that honey crop during that period of time, because the rest of the year, you don't have as much opportunity. So it's just a matter of setting the deck in a certain way that reflects exactly and how you're going to be able to extract the maximum amount of honey while considering all the risks. Right. So throughout the spring, and I think the, uh, the plant chart might be a little deceiving on the less plants, maybe as you uh, explain, but the availability is still there. So mm -hmm. as we come out of winter, we have, if we can manage to find areas of trees and such, we have that spring flow of pollen that comes from uh, the willows and the, the poplars and, and the maples and all that. So we're able to get that springtime flow and then it follows into dandelions and then we fall into clovers and then alfalfa as we kind of go with a bunch of other fruit trees around the edges. So there is a steady flow of pollen flowing at all times. It's just maybe not as available in other places as much as it is in, in certain places. So, you know, one of the strategy, strategies our farm has is we have availability of a lot of those early growing plants like the trees and the shrubs and and then the weeds and all that so i manage my operation around that and what i do is even though let's say we have a dandelion <clears throat> flow that comes in off the pastures that's really heavy you know I, i'm not looking at a flow like that to capitalize on a honey crop at that point because my focus is exclusively on that honey crop that comes in july and august so all the nectar and all the pollen that comes from the spring that leads up to my honey flow, I use to build my colonies. That is food. That is food that I'm using to uh, then not only build my colonies, but then take that strength and build more colonies with. So we're yeah. very focused on the uh, survival of the apiary, uh, manage the death loss and grow the operation up until the honey flow. So, so you're you're feeding pretty aggressively both um, sucrose syrup and pollen sub or pollen supplement in the spring. Yeah. Um, what ratio sucrose syrup do you like to feed? Are you feeding one to one or something thinner? Yeah, we're making sure that these colonies have that steady flow of sugars into the colonies at all times, and we're always reading that nest whether or not that west is nest is wet just by the available amount of sugar around that brood nest. We're always watching. And as soon as we notice that that rim of syrup around that brood nest is starting to dry up a little bit, because maybe the flows mm -hmm. uh, are changing or they're falling into dearth or weather. We have a terrible amount of weather variability up here. It will be yeah. 25 degrees one week and the next week will be, you know, two degrees in snow. So it's just like, how do you manage that? And we do that exactly as you say with supplements. So my, Primary, primary focus with sugars is just to make sure they have sugar within their colony. Uh, so I feed them a two to one because it's much easier to uh, uh, manage a heavier sugar. It doesn't ferment as quickly on you and such like that. Yeah. But if, um, if I want to kind of spark them up, uh, just flash syrup at them and open feeders, I might dilute the sugar just a little bit, knowing that they're going to take it up within a, the day or maybe two days just to get it in because the main thing is just to get that spark of sugar into the colony and just hmm. to make sure we maintain that, uh, that syrup around or not the syrup, but that sugar open sugar around the yeah. nest at all times. We're not feeding to bulk them up or just continually feed them a little bit flashes of syrup just to keep them going, spark them up. So we don't actually feed a lot of sugar to them, 
we more so put a lot of effort into feeding the sugar to them. <laughs> yeah. If that makes any sense. You, yeah. you so want to get just so, enough, just enough at just the right times. Yeah. It's kind of like a fire and you have a cup full of gas. <laughs> if you put that whole cup on the, uh, the fire, it just flashes back at you and it hurts you. But if you just take a little bit and just kind of throw it on the fire like this and just keep, keep that flare and going and you can maintain that flame a lot more effectively. So that's what we try to do with the sugar. And the thing with uh, the protein we put on our colonies is we have the advantage that we don't have small high beetle. I imagine yeah. you have small high beetle. Down oh, yeah. there. So we, we can manage our uh, protein feeding a, a lot looser than maybe you will have these rules you'll have to follow when you put that supplement on top. But I always have a pound of patty on top of my colonies all all times throughout the spring, just to provide them that uh, resource to dig into if they need to. Uh, we'll have a week of cold, snowy weather drop on us within like a day and a half's notice. That you, the weatherman can't find it, can't seem to figure it out. We don't know it's coming. They don't know it's coming. All of a sudden, bam, it's coming. And I can't get around my entire apiary in a day and a half to make sure they have that protein to sustain their development. Because yeah. these bees, I'm telling you, with the amount of, like we do have a lot of pollen and nectar coming in and then the maples come out, they start uh, packing their brood nest and, and in a way it bounds them up a little bit. So we do have that inflow, but those bees, they build their nest lock and step to that flow of pollen coming in. And they will at times be developing that nest out hand to mouth. It, it, like guys you have this like three frames of developed brood open brood going on that nest very little resource of pollen on the outside and just streams of it coming in and you're like ooh, if that flow of pollen stops all that open brood is going to starve and you know what they do yeah. is they cannibalize it so we recognize that nature where they're just you know igniting the growth of that nest they're making time uh, and if we see a dearth coming, we make sure they can maintain that momentum. Otherwise, they're going to fall backwards. Yeah. So that's a huge, huge uh, management practice we have adopt up here. Is when these bees, they come out of winter, their accelerated growth, we just make sure that they maintain it. And then we can build these massive nests through a short period of time in the spring. So we've talked a little bit about death loss, and I know that your winter shed's a big part of that. Um, people, I think can see that on your channel. Um, the swarm rate, do you have any idea of how many of your hives swarm every year? Well, it's hard to, not. it's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to know that, but, uh, yeah. I know that I, you agree, you aggressively, like you have got one of the most management intensive beekeeping operations that I've seen because you aggressively equalize, um, it's like, you've got one foot on the gas all the time trying to get these hives to grow and be ready for for the canola bloom they've got to be big they've got to be huge but you don't want them to swarm so you've got one foot on the gas and then you want to pull the rug out from under them right before they swarm and split them yeah. and make make more colonies um so you i mean you're like walking a tightrope in, in your operation trying to balance all this stuff and it'd be pretty easy to fall off the edge one way or the other um so yeah, i one, really one I foot really on the, <laughs> one foot on the gas one foot on the brake yeah. it burns out your clutch and i'm the clutch right <laughs> <laughs> but that's exactly right uh don't mean to interrupt you but uh to produce big hives uh, in the way we are, and we're using carnelian type uh, stock, which is more prone to swarming than other stock, you'd argue. But, you know, we're trying to manage these massive hives uh, with a swarmier type B in a short period of time, um, right through the middle of swarming season. So, and the, how do you, how do you manage a big hive without swarming to be able to grab that big cro crop of honey? And that is the secret question there. And that's where you see uh, me putting so much attention into uh, managing my colonies to try to promote that, you know, exponential growth and retain all those bees to make sure they're working for me. And it's a hard balance. And it's the only way that you'll be able to achieve that is just through experience and just be able to feel 
that colony and their growth rate. And uh, these guys are going to tip themselves over the edge. It's got to pull them back just a little bit. Or uh, these guys, you know, we could get a little bit more out of them. So we boost them up. So we're, we're continually growing. And then we continually, uh, well, then we, we, mat we harvest the surplus. We, we uh, at a certain point of time through the spring, we just decide you need to be this strong. You don't need to be that strong. So we're going to harvest all this extra strength and then build more colonies out of that. And then after we do that, we want to maintain their growth. Uh, we want to promote that growth to, to retain, you know, to make those big hives. And we still don't want them to swarm. So we're, and every colony is a little bit different. You have some queens that really spark her up. Then we have other queens that just, you know, a slow and steady progression. So you got to identify those queens that are a little bit hotter. You just pull a little bit more back from those guys because you don't want them to swarm and maybe boost this guy up a little bit. So we're always going through and sifting. And I kind of look at it as if, um, I'm trying to comb my uh, youngest daughter's hair. She's long hair, right? And it kind of gets all tangled up. You don't, uh, you don't take the knots out with one stroke of the brush. You take it out with a whole bunch of multiple brushes, right? And she's not screaming then. And then it overall, it's easier for you to straighten that hair out. So the same with beekeeping, you just got to approach the situation at, uh, with a strategy to achieve that, uh, problem at a whole bunch of different times all the way through the year so in the spring in may i take my mace my main split harvest off the bees and we turn them primarily into nukes now we draw up a queen cell in there and we foster this great big nuke operation behind me and then after that i'm going through and we provide them the space we allow that queen you know two boxes still to grow and maintain that second box is that honey box now where she has unlimited space and we just sift back and forth. So it's really easy work, really. You just go in and you just look at the girth of the colony and you just take down the bigger ones and you just boost up the smaller ones. So it's really easy work. You shake the bees off the frame. So it's just a matter of shifting back and forth brood. And then as soon as, you know, everything just seems to line up all nice and perfect, we get the solstice, which is that magical time in the world where, you know, nature shifts gears. It's a really yeah. weird thing, but bees are very responsive to that point of time. So that passes. And then all of a sudden the whole countryside comes to life with flowers and growth and prosperity. And it kind of redirects the bees attention from that swarmy reproductive spirit to that. Okay. Here's our opportunity to gather and hoard and get ready for winter. So we take advantage of that spirit shift and uh, we can find them and we send them straight into the flow and hopefully we've done our job properly so it's these hives within the next three weeks after that all this brood emerges and they just explode into growth and i have hives that'll fill boxes you know as far as you can reach just because they're so busy and there's so many bees in there and it's just an amazing thing so yeah it's a awesome. continual balance around that but the other the other thing that we focus on and this is you know, you look at the whole uh, management strategy I employ in nutrition and disease control. Uh, we have the swarm management, you know, where we're managing the growth of the colonies very intensively. The, the other very important aspect is this whole thing is um, attrition of our operation. How do you, as a beekeeper, manage that continual attrition, not just through the winter, but through the entire year? Like we'll come out of winter with, let's say, 10% uh, winter loss. The bees aren't done dying yet. Yeah. They'll die through the spring. They'll die through the summer. They'll die through the fall. So we got to be able to manage that continual attrition. So we have another 5%, let's say, in the, in the spring. And let's say we have a, a tough summer, another 10% there. And we drift into fall <clears> and we recognize another 5% there. So what is that 10, 20, 30? So that's an overall 30% a loss of colonies with within that full cycle. And if you have a bad year, that could very easily be 50% lost within that time frame. And beekeepers are like, oh, that's terrible. You know, this is this is pretty rough or hard done by, but that's that's a natural thing. That's what bees naturally do. They they naturally follow a progressive cycle. They live, they you know produce or produce and then die. It's, it's just like every other living thing on the planet. We need to be able to recognize that as beekeepers and then manage that. So I don't take losses 
as losses. I just kind of embrace losses and manage them. So, and, and the way I do that is a continual um, refreshing my stock. So through the spring, as these colonies are growing, we manage uh, all this surplus strength and we channel that into nuke production. So we're focusing on creating uh, new units and a whole bunch of new units with fresh queens that we've just developed. We manage these nukes throughout the summer, uh, just kind of maintaining and developing these queens. Our only focus is just maintenance of that colony and developing them into something that'll make winter. At the same time, we're managing them in such a way that we can extract a honey crop off them and it covers all their cost. So we're developing this battery of nukes uh, that sits behind us that doesn't cost us anything, just a time and effort. And then what we do is that following year, as we assume these losses, we just start dropping them into all these empty spots. Yeah. So at 10% uh, winter loss, we just fill them instantly with these nukes. And that's a complete refresh of that spot. Throughout the spring, uh, if we can find these hives that are failing and before they die, we take these hives out and we drop them into the nuke operation and requeen them. And that empty spot, we drop a fresh nuke into there. So we're not, you know, it's the curse of the beekeeper. You're looking at your stock and that hive's not doing so well. Ah, maybe I'll just leave it there because I pull it out, it'd be a dead spot. I don't want to see a bunch of dead spots. So then what we end up having is an apiary that's kind of riddled with all these unproductive colonies. Yeah. So my focus is to make sure that each and every one of those spots within my apiary is a productive unit. And if it's not up to snuff throughout my assessments, if I notice that they're falling back a little bit, we take it before it dies, we salvage it and we throw it into the nuke operation, refresh it. But we can do that because we have that nuke, that fresh one to immediately drop into that spot. And that way we can continually refresh the colony through or the apiary without with throughout the entire year and just maintain its youth and its vigor. Yeah. I don't think any beekeeper will argue that a young colony will be a more productive colony. Uh, I mean, if we can just maintain a higher level of youth continually within our stock, then they're just going to be a lot more productive. The same thing we do with our cattle operation. We have the, the young ones like the heifers. We have have uh, the very productive ones in the middle age, and then we have the old ones at the end of their life. We continually call back the older ones that are under as productive to, you know, refresh with younger stock in there to make a very productive operation. So that's kind of the strategy we follow within our operation here too, is it was just continual refresh. You know, well, raise the losses, drop them in, fill them in and let them go. I'm I'm taking three things out of what you just said. First of all, queen queens are Bob Benny says that queens are middle aged at about a year and a half. So past a year and a half, they are very likely to start declining. And I know that you are not necessarily tracking all of your queen's ages, um, but you are tracking the productivity of each one of your nests. So you're trying to weed these these nests out and salvage the bees that are in them, put them into nuke production. So that continual culling is going to increase your wooden wear efficiency because you don't have these declining hives that are not going to make a, a honey crop. You're putting that wooden wear back into something that's either going to preserve its, pull its own weight, basically. It's going to pull its own weight. You're going to drop a new unit in that's going to make honey. And it, it's also increasing your labor efficiency because you're not going through those declining hives all the time, spending your time on that, putting good money after bad. You're not putting pollen sub on them, uh, giving them new brood. You know, those resources could go into other hives where they would actually do some good. So I see a lot of efficiency in, in that type of management strategy. Yeah, and it's a beautiful thing. Once you get that cycle going, it took me a long time. You know, I build this battery of nukes that's sitting mm -hmm. behind me, and I come out of spring, and I have all these bees that have a value on them now, and I could sell them for good money. But I, and it's hard to then, you know, take those bees to shift out hives that maybe you're anticipating their failure. So, you know, taking that unit and shifting it out, replacing that 
in a way, it translates costing you money, but you can't look at it that way. You have to look at their overall cycle and the overall management of the operation and how important cycling this fresh stock back into your operation is to maintain its integrity and viability. And ultimately, as you carry that forward year after year, you're going to then have surplus stock to the side that you won't need to drop into your operation as as uh, as much, and you can then glean a little bit of extra revenue off those extra nukes that you've produced, and you know tap into a revenue source there. But that's always there because if you have a terrible winter for whatever reason, all these circumstances we've talked about earlier, and with our relationship with environment and farmers and development and all this, all these factors, disease come together uh it doesn't matter sometimes what we do as beekeepers we just fall onto hard times and we might experience heavy losses but it doesn't hurt as bad because if we have a nuke uh, a battery of nukes behind us we can just kind of erase those losses and just carry on you know what i mean that's a big cost efficiency measure too you're producing your own queens you're producing your own bees uh you know if you're a commercial guy or looking at it as a business it it's going to be really hard to pencil out buying buying stock except for introducing new um you know new genetics it's gonna be really hard to pencil in buying queens and and all that stuff so i think that's a big cost savings for you yeah it's a pillar to my management uh it's just maintaining the stock like as sustainable within my own operation and if i need to bring in genetics i'll buy queens i'm not afraid to bring it in stock i assess them before i breed them but uh, and if i do fall into a bad year i will buy in packages just to fill in some boxes but for the most part i try to keep everything internal and keep my dependence on everybody else very minimal because when you're depending on other people for other things you become dependent on their situations and their incomes which is totally reflective on what we're doing within our own operations and these bees that we're producing, like you talk about a year and a half uh, lifespan of that queen, which is its most effective. I can stretch it out just a little bit further. Cause what, what do I do when I, when we create these summertime Queens, I don't give them a lot of space to maintain that yeah. nest out. I, I force them into that little box. And I, I, you know, I keep them tight and I restrict that development of that queen. And you think, well, shit, they're going to swarm. But we do it in just a certain time of the year, you know, after the solstice, after the back end of this honey flow up here, these queens have established their nest and they're not thinking about anything other than the winter ahead of them. So they are able to maintain these nice little nests that then drift into winter without, you know, uh, wasting a lot of their potential during that maintenance year of those queens. Get them through winter the next spring pow those queens go to town and they make me a lot of bees and they make me a lot of honey because they're they're still fresh and fresh queens don't you know swarm as much so maybe yeah. another factor in producing big hot colonies is to maintain a youthful apiary and they just make me a lot of money and you know sometimes well most of them get go into winter follow through and that's when i then follow through the cycle and probably selecting some of those out uh to requeen but a lot of them i find a lot of my colonies tends to uh handle that situation internally through super procedure and it's something that kind of scares a lot of beekeepers and this is maybe where it sets my type of operation a little bit differently than other types where I'm more of a stationary type. This type of management strategy doesn't really reflect as well on a, a migratory type beekeeper where he needs to know the condition of the youth of the queen at all times of the year. My hives, if they have a problem with your queen, they'll just switch it out and put a new one in there. You know, the ability of my hives being in one place all the time just allows them that opportunity to do such without the risk of losing that colony because you're you're messing around with it with transportation and such so when i'm going through and i'm uh selecting my breeders i'm not necessarily looking for the age of the queen on my tag in that colony i'm looking for the the amount of time that colony has been able to sustain itself through a number of years yeah. and it tells me whatever dynamics are going inside there uh reflects on their ability to you know switch those queens out continually over the years some of these queens are like or some of these hives are five or six years old i'm looking at the tag and like oh that's a long time it's not the same queen it's probably multiple queens going on within there but 
<clears throat> that's what I want to promote is that continual succession internally, have them handle all that work themselves, right? Yeah. If there's other <clears throat> circumstances that fall upon them, if they swarm <clears throat> or if they try superseding themselves and <clears throat> as they try to reestablish their stock, you know, maybe that queen's not mated properly or, or maybe some other situation comes in where the queen's inferior, then I can come in, assess that situation pinch her off, reestablish her, move them forward. So it's all, you know, one great big management strategy that just kind of follows through. That's and awesome. It cuts cost. If the beekeeper, as if in regards to profitability and your entire theme of uh, kind of what you wanted to talk to me about, as a beekeeper, we recognize these opportunities of revenue, you know, a whole bunch of different revenues coming in. But at the same time, we have to focus on our costs of operation and chip those away at all times. And just this management strategy going into the nuke production and maintaining my own queens and such, it's uh, completely cut that uh, expense off my ledger. Uh, queens replacement stock, two very expensive line items there that I've been able to eliminate. In fact, I've been able to add to revenue because I, I make those queens and those uh, re that replacement stock that we build, I make them generate me revenue through honey production. So it, it, you know, that focus on expenses ultimately provided more profitability to my business. 